Welcome back to AP Taylor Swift. We have a great episode for you today, but before we tell you the topic, we want to do a little couple class announcements, a little homework for you as we always do. Um, if you're enjoying our podcast, please do us a favor and rate and review us on your favorite podcast app, Spotify, Apple. I think you can only leave reviews on, on Apple, right? Like written reviews. So yes. Leave us one. We'd love to hear what you think. Um, if you have feedback for us. So if you like us, leave us a review. If you have <laughs> feedback for us, you can uh, find us on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. And we'd love to hear your feedback. You can DM us, um, review us, and follow us or subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. That way you never miss an episode. So with that, Jen, why don't you introduce our topic for this show and tell? Yes, and fair warning to our listeners, we are getting into a topic that was one of my personal passions in grad school, so this might be one of my nerdier podcasts. And fair warning to my co-host, I might black out and I um, take no responsibility for what podcasts? I think. Wait, pause. <laughs> the, all of these podcasts are nerdy podcasts. It's true, but this is one of the topics, like, I wrote a big paper on this, like, I went in deep on this. We're about to, um, right, so we're about to... Bit- we're about to go from AP to master's level. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're getting our master's in Taylor Swift. Yeah. I love it. So why don't um, you uh, Yes. You our topic know, what is, it? is mad women. Um, so the ideas of uh, really cultural constructs of female insanity um, and kind of what that means and how we got there. And there's so much we'll talk about with our songs, but I thought a fun way to kind of get us started, kind of um, prime the pump, if you will. It's a very teacher thing to say. Just kind of going through the history of the word hysteria, because I think it's really informative. So uh, hysteria, uh, which is right out the gate, is really not shy about what it is, because hysteria, the word originates from the Greek word for uterus, which was hystera. Um, And Greeks. We... (laughs) Yeah, right. We have records of this word being used from all the way back in 1900, uh, 1900 BC. Um, and it was kind of coming from the Egyptians and it was extreme emotions, like uncontrollable emotions is often what it's referred to. But um, <clears throat> and even now, like it's no longer a medical diagnosis because we obviously have things like depression or anxiety or like actual diagnoses and hysteria was kind of this like blanket term um but you even get back in like let me see here in ancient rome uh the word was still always was extreme emotions but it did also sometimes have to do with like they thought it was like a wandering uterus just this like misunderstanding of like the female anatomy which hasn't changed that much. (laughs) Yeah, right. I was going to say, like, that doesn't happen today, a misunderstanding of the female anatomy. But so this was something that was only spoken of about women. Only women were considered to have hysteria. Was there a male equivalent? No, not really. It wasn't until uh, you get a one of the first female doctors in Europe, Troda de Ruggiero. I'll put it in the show notes. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe she and maybe Hildegard of Bingen um, was another female doctor of the time started kind of saying like this could be a male thing too. But it's also around that time it started getting very religious and it would become sort of like let's try an exorcism to try oh, to resolve right. this. Um, and throughout Casual. it too... I can't find my reference right now either. And I'm this, that's, I'm sorry about that, but I'll try to find it. Do you have open hysteria and mad women right now? So many, but there was also many times throughout this, definitely in like the Victorian era, um, which is where a lot of my personal knowledge comes from, like the research I did, but off and on throughout this too, it's, what's really interesting is hysteria was it was definitely extreme emotions, but it could also be things like unwillingness to bear a child or uh, postpartum depression or uh you know a lack of interest in sex with a man not being straight like not being a, a straight woman um so there was this just very it was a very blanket word that just kind of covered anything wrong with women that men didn't like yeah what what things i was gonna use the word deviant and i think that was accurate for the time but i, I want to know that that is not how we would see it but it was kind of a blanket term for th- any behavior that society would have considered deviant behavior for a woman 
and it was just a term you could just kind of slap on and say like oh well she has hysteria so we should do something about this or she's just kind of crazy and you get into it more with like freud and stuff which is something that we will probably be addressing at some point in the future um on a different episode um and eventually you do get some people being like oh like well men can have hysteria men can exhibit the syndrome but it was definitely like much later not very many people um and then it really i think it started pivoting after world war one or world war two when you start getting shell shock and these other things of men who are you know going to war and coming back with you know what we now know is post-traumatic stress syndrome um but that that behavior is when the diagnosis i i would say was like sort of a bigger turning point of like we maybe need more distinction and how to discuss these things um yeah i want to add that in addition to kind of the Western view of hysterical women, like on, on the like kind of Greek and British kind of colonial European side, um, obviously women have been seen as hysterical and mad across all cultures. So I had the pleasure of taking uh, a gender studies class for Eastern, uh, going through Eastern literature a little bit as well. And what's really interesting is, um, the words that were used to describe these kinds of women were different. And in many cultures, women did often have more agency for certain kinds of things. Uh, it wasn't mm. always the same as what was in Europe. But with colonization, a lot of the European projections that were also put on women of other, col uh, of other cultures, very consistent, unfair, like words like savage, um, women were always point painted to be either very exotic or uncultured, uncivilized. Um, and in the way that they were doing things, even when they had some cultural differences, um, women specifically were were targeted and, and kind of painted to be these kind of wild creatures but within the cultures themselves like even if the word was not hysterical every culture had some version of this where even the women had different levels of agency and they had there were different norms that they could and couldn't do there were always there was always some version of this that existed um in china for example if, if there was any infidelity at all like women would be taken kicking screaming um and, and murdered like it was illegal to have okay. that kind of thing so so and there you really get this portrait of like a completely crazy woman who has lost her head and is going being dragged away screaming kicking but she's about to be killed for something like infidelity so um it's just an interesting concept because that's a one-sided thing only women yeah are well it was only guilty yeah. of it was it was only illegal when women did it it was fine when men did oh, it so cool. yeah it yeah. was great yeah love that exactly so so it's it's really interesting and i love to like just also take that broader lens because it's universal it's just kind of yeah. shown itself in different ways the double standards of men versus women and what's acceptable for men is unacceptable for women yeah, yeah and it's and we can I, we could finish off this uh, introduction with this because this is going down a path that we could go into for a long time well this is why but we're it, getting our masters on this topic right right but it is always true that it's a symptom of a patriarchal culture and that's the reason why there are those double standards if lineage and inheritance comes through the man then a woman cannot stray because she could be messing with that patriarchal line of inheritance um, mm. But if he does, it doesn't matter because whatever. But in a matriarchal society, if it's going through the women, it doesn't really matter um, because it's the woman's genes. So it's it, a lot of it kind of goes back to that very basic. If you start to kind of like pull at some of those threads that it's, it is and it is, but it is it's one of those things, too, where it's like it's not good. I think we've talked about this in other episodes where you can look at systems, you can look at literature, you can look at anything and say, I don't agree with it, but I see how that logic lines up on that side of things. And I think that's important too, of like the idea that a man can cheat and a woman should be killed for it seems insane to us. But if the logic is, well, if she gives birth to my son, he will get my title. He will get my money. He will get all of my property. So she better not stray because I don't want to give all of my stuff to, to someone, someone else's who's not kid. Mine. Again, still not right but like you can when you start to see that logic it's easier to be like okay now how do i navigate this um because it's wrong but you can see how they think it makes sense <clears throat> so it's gonna be a fun episode guys <laughs> all right well let's get into it all right so i have the first song today i am doing 
better than revenge. Uh, depending on which angle you approach this from, it could be one of the earlier songs that we'll be discussing today or one of the latest, uh, because there are two versions, of course, and uh, in this particular instance, the lyrics do change a little bit in Taylor's version. Um, for the sake of supporting our queen, Taylor Swift, I'm going to pretend that we're sticking to the uh, new Taylor's version, um, so if, if that's the audio you want to listen to, uh, but... Of course, I'm going to be referencing the lyrics of the original because how can we not? Um, so this song came out originally in 2010. It was on Speak Now and it was written by Taylor Swift. I seem to have a pattern for doing songs that are love only this. written by her. Yeah. Um, we say our boy Jack, but it's not Monzi's boy Jack. No, I love our it's boy fun. Jack as much as the next one person, but um, I definitely love a good song that's written by Taylor only. So this song is... I mean, it's fun because it's fast paced. It feels vengeful. It's got a ton of energy and it was written when Taylor was younger. So it's youthful. It definitely feels like she took to a notebook to scribble out some really mean, nasty lyrics. In this instance, she is, I, I think the song writer in this song is the mad woman, but the word mad is kind of literally in the sense of like angry, vengeful, um, mm. heartbroken maybe, and is, is reacting. What's interesting is in many of the later songs, you see a lot of like female camaraderie and women lifting up women or women empathy. In this earlier song, it is just tearing another woman to shreds, uh, and that it's, it's almost in an admonishing way. So right from the very beginning, now go stand in the corner and think about what you did. Ha, time for a little revenge. It just starts off in this little like scolding kind of way. Right. Like you're talking exactly. to a child. Like if you just hear those two lines, you're like, oh, a kid did something yeah, wrong. And you <laughs> I love the opening and the way she like messes with her voice where it's like kind of like, I don't even know the word for it, like electronic sounding almost. Mm. Yeah, and the whole thing is told like a story, as so many of her earlier songs were. Um, the story starts when it was hot and was summer, and we take it through uh, as as the thing unfolds. I just love like how I love how antagonistic the song is because it's just something that you don't really see in a lot of lyrics. She's not a saint; uh, she's a, an actress, which is the original lyrics. The newer lyrics she eventually changed to take away the mattress, uh, the mattress implications. You can talk about how the lyrics change from one song to the next, but um, I think like one thing to this think through is like, even when she re-released the song, the full meaning of the song did not change. It still remains a revengeful right. kind of it's song. Still the same song. You still have that same anger, but she does take it down a notch to not play super dirty and talk about maybe giving like that kind of a low blow. Well, let's let's talk about the lyric for a second because we I think we may have some new Swifties who maybe are not as familiar with the lyrics and the lyric change. So maybe we go through it and and we can talk about what that does or does not change for the song or for how mad she really yeah. is. So it's hard for me to say this without singing it, but she's not a saint and she's not what you think. <laughs> she's an actress. Whoa. She's better known for the things that she does on the mattress. Whoa. Soon she's going to find out stealing other people's toys on the playground won't make you many friends. She should keep in mind there is nothing I do better than revenge. That's the original lyrics. And really you know, it's really hard that. not to. <laughs> the woes. Uh, the woes. <laughs> uh, has been changed to she's not a saint and she's not what you think. She's an actress. Whoa. He was a moth to the flame. She was holding the matches. Whoa, soon she's going to find stealing other people's toys on the playground won't make you many friends. She should keep in mind, there's nothing I do better than revenge. So the difference is really uh, she's better known for the things that she does on the mattress versus he is a moth to, the flame. Moth to the flame. She was holding the, the matches. Very different. I think lyrics. it's a really very different, especially because the first version, this song is blaming the other woman for being the other woman, right? We go back to our conversation on infidelity. And I was like, yeah, because a man's not involved in infidelity at all. You have the same kind of thing here where the woman is being blamed. The other woman is being blamed for infidelity when the man had just as much agency 
as the woman. And so in this lyric change in the first version, it she's playing on this person, this woman's reputation. In the second version, you're actually bringing him in. He was a moth to the flame and actually like he insinuating that while she held the matches, he was a moth to the flame. He was he's attracted still, and had he's some still kind of here. helpless. Like the way that she, the the way the analogy yeah, is is like well, sure. he couldn't help but be attracted to the matches, and she was still holding the matches. Yeah, but at least that's fair. Yeah, you're acknowledging that you're bringing him in in a different way. He's involved, right? In, because otherwise, he's really not addressed here, other than the second line. I had it all. I had him right there where I wanted him. Like, well, I mean, she calls him a toy essentially later of like stealing other is. people's toys on the playground. So he seems very much a non-factor that this is like two very him. strong women kind of battling mm. over some guy, <laughs> <laughs> some dude who's just a play. Pick. <laughs> it's an interesting song to bring into this conversation because I feel like usually, not usually, but in some of the other songs we'll talk about the person causing the madness is a man and here the person causing is a that woman. Madness yeah. Is I, woman. I, it's on the madness specifically, there, there's a few lines in here that really, she even acknowledges as the speaker that she is being mad. Uh, there's a line. She thinks I'm a psycho. Cause I like to rhyme her name with things, but sophistication isn't what you wear uh, or who, you know, you're like acknowledging straight. She's like, I've lost all reason. I know that I'm being crazy. I think like in that context, the reason I wanted to talk about that changed lyric, it's interesting because I understand why she changed the lyric later on to make it a little mm. bit more tasteful. Uh, in for this decade, but at the same time, well, not slut shaming because it was a yeah, slut shaming. But at lyric. the same time, the song is still blaming the woman, and to me, it's yes. like either you're a mad woman or you're not. Like you can't just have like this one line of sense where she's like, "Oh, like maybe mm. it wasn't all that bad." Uh, it seems a little out of place to me to to suddenly like tone that down so significantly because she herself, the speaker is the one who is seemingly mad in this. And and we use mad in the angry sense, but I think you could also say in like, she's adding acting psychotic. Like she's saying things she would normally never say, or she's, she's kind of losing her mind. So it's just like weird to have a toned down version of that lyric. That's actually kind of reasonable. I think it depends for me if you're looking at this song from a hyperbolic perspective, if you're seeing this as like, this is her actual feelings and emotions. And because if it's hyperbolic, if we look at this song from like a blank space perspective, then I agree with you completely. Like, yeah. why take that out? Go lean into the mad woman and into the anger and to, into the hysteria. But this was to our knowledge at least written about a, an actual situation and an actual person. And so I think that lyric was changed to acknowledge not trying to put somebody down that like, not to say trying to slut chain someone. She can still yeah. be angry and be mad um, without having to slut chain. Uh, and I think that's a good, anybody. that's a good point. I think I do look at it from a hyperbolic way, mainly because of the way it starts and some the way that some of the lyrics are. It's very like, yeah, I'm scolding this girl. Yeah, it's it playful. Is, it's playful, but it's yeah. like condescending and scolding and kind of an extreme. Yeah. I think to me, the mattress line is we. It feels like something that she, you. Everything else that she says in this song is can something be something that the speaker does know. This other girl does wear vintage dresses and did steal her man and did do all these other things. And the mattress thing to me felt like, uh, yes, slut shaming, but also like she doesn't totally okay. know. Like there that's when, when you're in high school or when you're in any, I went to a private Christian school and was very much in the goody two shoe friend group. So this wasn't my personal experience, but like I have heard other things Just, of like disclaimer, <laughs> disclaimer, but, uh, you see it and you hear it of like, oh, people talking about like some girl being easy or being like, mm. you know, she's going to sleep with everyone. Well, it's a rumor. And it's often not true or it's exaggerated. And so everything else here is like, it's, it is hyperbolic, but it's like, I saw this happen. Mm -hmm. And the mattress line is a like, that might just be the rumor mill. She doesn't know. Like it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like 
even close to verifiable information and the moth thing is verifiable like i saw you intentionally try to draw this boy to you away from me so you held up this match and you watched him come to you like that's more verifiable it still i think strongly implies seduction um but it's not saying saying she's better known for what she does on the mattress is acknowledging the gossip and the rumors of the school it is not saying like this is I feel like that particular line is like, mm. this girl could have been a victim of really unkind words. Um, and so it's just slightly switching it to it was still seduction. It was still intentional. It was still pulling this person away. Um, but it was not unverifiable gossip or anything like that. That's always how I felt that yeah, switch this switch went. This kind of like leads me to think through that there's almost like two interpretations. Like I actually think if we within the mad woman theme that we're the lens that we're looking at it through. Mm -hmm. I think the first version does that more justice because I think it truly, especially now comes across as like this crazy enraged lady. This is kind of like what men expect. It's like, they expect this person who has lost all of her chill, just tearing down like a vicious slashing down. It's that scene in Mean Girls where they're like, when Katie like looks out and like sees all the animals in the mall, it's like, yeah, it's like yeah. that version is kind of what you yes. see. It's like the completely like girls gone wild version. Yeah, attacking the each other. second version is like almost like the more realistic version, which is like, well, let's actually look at this through the lens of like females maybe, and not just what men want to see or not just what society or media wants to see and then let's actually analyze the emotions of this person uh and it seems somehow not as mad it's like actually there's a pretty reasonable woman who is scorned who is upset sure but she's still trying to remain reasonable and she doesn't want to give the rumor mill more fire she's being reasonable yeah you can tell there's been distance from the situation and when you in the second lyric, whereas the first raw. lyric is very much reactive and raw, raw emotions. And there literally was, what, nine years between Speak Now and Speak Now Taylor's version? I can't do math. Something like that. Ten years. My brain hurts. I can't. It's been a long time. She's over it. And clearly there's been distance. And I think that the changed line reflects reflection and distance did I say reflect but I also think it's interesting because it's like sometimes you need to view it from a different lens to be like oh like maybe she's not as mad as we thought she's just like she has reasonable emotions and she's upset but sometimes that's labeled as hysteria and I think that's a really great angle to to bring in here is like yeah this is an upsetting situation when someone when when you know I was gonna say someone takes your man but that is when that's the feeling right that's the initial response tends to be she took my man not he cheated strayed yeah. right he strayed right like you you there's this idea of placing blame on the other so that the person that you're with is is still innocent and still a little bit pure and that's and that's what this song that de- like reflects is she did it she's the problem oh hi she's the problem it's her I really like what you were saying kind of about almost the first version feels like sort of a male gazy perspective. Like the first version is something that as I think about it, you can see like this being a girl saying it to like some of her guy friends, like, Oh, well she's better known for what she's on the mattress. And they're like, ha ha. Yeah. Like bitches be crazy or whatever. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> is that... But the second version, like I, it's Regina, Jen as Regina George. Yeah, yeah, that's not a role I would play very well. Um, but the second version feels more female gazy of it's less of a like, oh, like, yeah, oh, haha, like girls are crazy. They just like have wild sex and stuff. And the second version is more like she like, she lit the flame. She like asked him to come like she did this. And I think that in some ways that's like a little bit sadder. I think hmm. the it, someone's better known for what they do on the mattress. It's just like, what well, you know, like you can't. Yeah. Yeah, but, like, the, like, this was more of a, like, a process of losing of her, like, lighting the match and summoning him over, and he went, and I feel like that's more of the conversation you would have with your girlfriends, where you're saying, like, she took him, like, she did this, she had a plan, she put this into motion, she stole him, and that hurts, and that was really hard, and I can't believe she did that, Um, and I I think you just kind of said that, and I was starting, like, I think that actually 
kind of fits the first one feels more male gazy of like oh yeah girls are crazy girls are gonna do all this together they're gonna have cat fights they're basically animals blah 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 just like all of this um but the updated version is a bit is more of how you would say it to your female friends so yeah i, think I might really even revise that slightly to say like it's not just male gazy but it was very much the narrative that has been out there that in culture or in society like the media wants you to believe yes. this is what movies were saying it's a very yes. 2011 right. narrative um and, and yeah. we can say male gazy because a lot of these sources at that time were run by men and now that you have more women yes. kind of behind yeah. the cameras behind the things like the the narrative is shifting a little bit and in that sense it's like kind of evolving um, and i think that is what the intention was behind changing the lyric uh yes. but in changed, that sense it's yeah. it's done very well um, the very last thing that I do want to touch on is this concept of revenge, which I think when you talk about Mad Woman, mm. you can't like one of the reasons that I thought this was a great song for Mad Woman out of the many, many options that exist in Taylor's uh, collection of songs is because of this concept of revenge. Like the, the title is better than revenge. She continues to say there's nothing I do better than revenge. And this idea of the mm. mad vengeful woman of that's the only way that you right. can react. Like, yes, this was an unfortunate situation. The woman, other woman stole her man. But the fact that she specifically wants to take revenge on her for that, um, I think is a is an old old trope of like women being these scheming conniving uh but ruthless kind of people who will come out they're not just gonna let it drop they're gonna do something about that um i i'm not sure if that's like a theme that we're gonna see in the in the rest of the songs but um would love to talk about that for just a second and just how has that changed at all in Taylor's songs as as she has matured or is that very much still the vigilante yeah. shit so no I don't <laughs> think it has changed I mean I think I think what you're getting at is what are a woman's options yeah. right um revet like doing nothing poison and, and, and is one option I mean have you have we seen reputation right. have right. we listened to the album reputation like I think what revenge means has changed. I think in this instance where she says she thinks I'm psycho because I like to rhyme her name with things, the song is referring to revenge as I'm going to write a song about you to get back at you. Um, I guess she still does do that, but it's not as pointed. She's not. I think it's interesting that she gave birth to this, her own reputation through this song, kind of. You know, like you have this whole album called Reputation where Taylor is like this dark vengeful uh person um snake that she like leans into but in this song and speak now so early on she was like there is nothing i do better than revenge like i would like to be known for that or at least the speaker in this song is going out there and saying i'm a master at revenge i do it best it's also very female country singer uh <gasps> You have, oh. like, Before mm. He Cheats, you yes, have... Yeah, but I was like, what's the song? Uh, Miranda Lambert had one, too, around the same time, where if you were a female country star in the 2010s, 2000s, and you wanted to write about something, like, that was a little more complex than, like, love or small towns, you're pretty much your only option for, like, a more raw emotion was some sort of, like, revenge, revenge or song. anger at a cheating partner like that was very much jolene because that yeah. gives you maybe more agency or makes it seem like you have more agency because something's in your control maybe i mean you yeah. can't be well yeah i was gonna say can you not be mad at the man but before you yeah. cheats is about the man yeah i mean she just should have said no from debut as well which was directed towards the partner who cheated yes. so it's a great song um, I do think it is interesting. I also think what's really interesting too about your point with reputation is reputation was putting that on as a character trait. Yes. And I do think this song was quite sincere. I don't think that this was, I don't think there's like a shred of I, irony in this. I think that's what's changed about how she handles revenge. It's, it's this la like, this is sincere and raw about a specific person. And we get a bit more storytelling she like takes out the concept of revenge through a bigger broader story like vigilante shit is is more of a hyperbolic satirical retelling of revenge but this is 
I don't read this as hyperbole. I read this as pretty straight. I think straight. that's right. I think like, what's just interesting is that the satire often that she does comes, we discuss this in our satire episode, is that it comes from all of these claims about her that other people are making that have been blown right. so out yes. of proportion that she decides to just go all in and lean into them. But here yeah. she was before any of that almost saying like I am this like labeling it herself she was she was sincere for sure but she was sincerely saying like there's nothing I do better than revenge and I know that um so that makes me just kind of question even some of those later songs and just be like is it really only based on what other people are saying or has she always believed that like has there been always like as a songwriter or as a character that she has written in her music like has she always really like been kind of proud of the fact that she is able to do revenge or is that like because I think with women when we we talk about agency all the time and I think like that idea of is revenge the only thing that a mad woman can really use as her tool to like really even the playing Hmm. field um is that a thing that she's really like proud of and owns because it's in in some way it's her exerting control I think it's also definitely I I might take this back, but I'm going to say it and then decide if I believe it. (laughs) I think it's very kind of younger woman. Again, also very much placed in the time where it was. I'd be interested to hear from like a a Gen Z or I guess Gen Alpha is in high school now of like what what, is frightening. What those, (laughs) what, what those um, young women think and feel, because I think for us at that time, we were on like kind of the cusp of a little bit more of a you do you kind of mindset in the world but we weren't really there yet uh and I can I can definitely see how a revenge fantasy as a high school girl was kind of one of your only outlets of like what else what else are you gonna do if you actually act out again we'd say mad woman as an angry but or as crazy but like you had limited options if you did something that was too quote unquote too dramatic or anything you could be labeled it could really hurt like the rest of your high school experience so like this kind of revenge fantasy might be one of the only outlets um yeah the reason I was gonna maybe take that back is um I do have more options now but I definitely still indulge in a revenge fantasy every now and then in my brain so maybe we never fully grow out of it because sometimes it does just kind of help you in that moment um well yeah journaling this is basically like she journaled but then she actually like yeah published and then she was like well and it was it is like the big plot in mean girls of regina taking revenge with the burn book and like and we keep who knew this was going to be our mean girls episode (laughs) mad woman mean girls i don't know same thing um and and we keep talking about vigilante shit which was another song that i was very strongly considering doing for this um but I think that the fact that that song is newer, she's older, the revenge is more sophisticated, but it is still very much there. Like originally, I think I just viewed that song as purely satirical. Um, But actually now in context with this, I'm like, maybe that is just a tool. Just like people are always like, oh, poison is the murder weapon of choice for women. It's like, to me, I'm like, revenge is like maybe the choice, uh, choice action or the choice consequence for women. You're a mad woman, you know? I think revenge just gets more yeah. sophisticated. Like I think vigilante shit's just a more sophisticated, she's better still really than revenge. Proud of herself, she's just reporting to yeah, the government. She, yeah, she is just, really smug about yeah. it. Like she's still really proud of it. Like it's like almost like a part of me is like realizing like she still feels there is nothing she does better than revenge. We should do a side by side comparison of better than revenge and vigilante shit and track the the, the the similarities and differences and how she's matured in her revenge fantasy. There were so many choices for what song yes. we could do for this episode. It, it was really, really hard yeah. to narrow it down. So maybe we just do a part two. <laughs> I have the next song. And as I usually do, I went quite literal. I chose Mad Woman because it felt like a big miss to do an episode called Mad Woman and not cover the song Mad Woman. So there were lots and lots of choices, um, but I went quite literal. So Mad Woman came out on Folklore in 2020. This is track 12. And it was written by Ta- Taylor Swift. I just combined their names for a second. Taryn. Taylor Swift and Aaron Dessner. This song, so Better Than Revenge was upbeat and like high energy. This song is not that. This song is very slow and dark. Um, as And it's one of the few examples, not few, but 
she doesn't often do that. I feel like often the songs, the music, and the lyrics are different. Um, so Death by a Thousand Cuts, for example. High energy, high upbeat song. The title and the lyrics are kind of sad and depressing. Here, it's all just dark and depressing. Um <laughs> I mean, it's literally but called would, Mad Woman. So you I know. Argue, there's, the, no, there's no angle. Like, I, or like there is, but like, I would, no, no, no. Oh. I mean, like in the sound, like just in Better and like in. Yeah. It's yeah. Do, do, like in Better do, Than do, yeah. Revenge. It's, it is not angry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, that's what I meant. Yeah. So like musically yeah. in Better Than Revenge, it was like, it's yeah. It's stewing. This is stewing in yes. madness. Yes. As opposed to that right. vengefulness of Better Than Revenge. This is like seeping seething yes no, that's a great word. yeah seething and it starts out with a bunch of rhetorical questions what did you think i'd say to that does a scorpion sting when fighting back they strike to kill and you know i will like whoa so right off the bat you have this what did you think i'd say to that this there is anger in the lyrics even if it's not in the music um and there's like, what were my options? Like you, so we have our characters here. We have a you who did something wrong and the I, the, the songwriter, the speaker, who is already defensive about whatever the situation is. And she does, in the second line, does a scorpion sting when fighting back. She brings in a lot of animal imagery in this song to illustrate her anger and her feelings. So scorpion stinging, You'll poke the bear till her claw comes out. I don't. Are drag, dragons animals? Yes. If they're mythical, I, I breathe flames each time I talk. So you've got a lot of questions in the song. You've got a lot of animal imagery, and all of the emotions are negative. Um, they strike to kill. Does she mouth fuck you forever? You call F-bombs. me crazy. Every time you call me crazy. Yeah, F-bombs. So we'll put an explicit on this episode. It's fine. Every time you call me crazy, <laughs> I get more angry. When you say I seem angry, I get more angry. So, like, there's just tons and tons of negativity. And then the other imagery I pull that I highlighted is around death. There's a lot of imagery of death. You'll find something to wrap your noose around. Women like hunting witches, too. And it's obvious that wanting me dead has really brought you two together. So you got... Mad animals, you got negative, you know, language, you got rhetorical questions, and you've got a lot of death. And I wrote down three questions of my own um, when looking through this song. Who or what is the cause of madness, I think, is an interesting thing to explore in this song. Who gets blamed or hurt by the madness? So who is blamed for being mad and who is hurt by actually being mad? And is there another option other than madness? And I don't know that we're going to be able to go into all three of these in just a show and tell, but those are the three things that I kept thinking about when reading through this song. I like the first question a lot because I do – one of the things that I loved about this song is that, yes, she's a mad woman, but here we have the other person made her this way, and she is being very pointed about that. I think in – even in Better Than Revenge, like clearly it was somebody else that was causing the need for revenge. Um, but I think that because the mad woman, hysterical woman idea is such an old idea, I love the idea that we are now getting into these lyrics that talk about the cause behind that and the fact that no woman is just mad because she's a woman. Because that is often exactly. what is communicated. It's like women are crazy. There is a... Right, exactly. And she even says, like, every time you call me crazy, I get more crazy. What about that? And that, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It reminded me. Oh, my God. It reminded me. But my dad always used to say to my mother, relax, just relax. And she was like, 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 that is the last thing you tell someone who needs to relax. Like, just relax. So, like, every time you call me, I get more. Every time you call me crazy, I get more crazy. Every t- when when you say I seem angry, I get more angry. Like, I no shit. also thought of my mother because I just like <laughs> I just 
I remember my, my mom, like when we were younger, like we'd be acting up and she was like, you guys are all going to drive me insane. Like she would just say that all the time. She's like, I'm going to have to get checked in to an insane asylum and it will be all your fault. Like you are all <laughs> driving me to the bridge. Cause brink of, of insanity. Who or, who or what is the cause of madness? And I think that's a really interesting thing for her to say because like, re- like why is madness the option? Is there another option is what I want to is like the question that I come up with that situation um, and this song, like, and I, and I think the whole point of this song is that like, I'm only considered a mad woman because you think I'm a mad woman. That goes back to the conversation on hysteria, right? Like prophecy. You, you only think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. I think, I think something that could be uh, informative here too, is kind of tiptoeing a little bit into the world of disability studies. Ooh. Um, so there is a short story We'll put it in the show notes called the country of the blind by hg wells that i honestly think changed my life forever and it's a story of a man standard man who kind of like gets lost in the mountains or something somehow some other way he stumbles upon a society where they have all been blind for generations um and he is like well i can see so this is great and he's trying to explain it to them and they're like you're crazy like what are you talking about like that's not a thing he would like describe stuff and they'd be like like they ultimately end up almost like killing him for being like a witch because he's like oh well someone's coming and they're like there's no way you can know that because they can only know it they when someone know comes that sight here is the a footsteps thing. yeah and um so they think he's just absolutely insane and the the and they live great lives like they all function perfectly well have a great society you know like everything is going well for them and the whole concept of it is that disability only exists in a construct where in a society Mm. where that is constructed to not work for the people who are different than what the standard is um so you you know think about if everyone knew sign language being deaf would not be considered any sort of a disability and in fact most people who are deaf or hard of hearing don't consider themselves um, as part of the disabled community because they have a language and they can function just fine that it's not um and so it's it's an interesting that really changed whenever you see someone who's like it it kind of starts to like blow your mind open of like if someone is not doing really well everyone now particularly in the in an very individualistic society that we live in it's like well they need to try harder they need to figure out how to fit in and it's like well what if we just change society a little bit then they would be just fine Mm. like why why is it that they have to fix themselves to fit us when we're all perfectly capable of just being a little bit more like equal and accessible and open to some slight differences but we label these things as crazy or as a disability or as something and it's so like a woman, that's kind of where his, the, why I wanted to start with the definition of hysteria, because when you start getting into it, really hysteria, this quote unquote medical diagnosis was really women functioning in a way that was Different. deviated from the norm. And you can like, I'm child free by choice. A hundred years ago, I would have been probably categorized as a, a, a victim witch. of hysteria, as a witch. <laughs> There's so many things. But because I live at a time where things have opened up a little bit more, I mean, I probably would have had kids, honestly. Like, I wouldn't have even thought about whether or not I do. But um, I can make that choice now when I am not being put into uh, in sort of a insane asylum, as it would have been called then, or any sort of institution, as we would call it now. Um, because we have changed our expectations. We have changed the way we have constructed society to say that's fine you can function just fine with that very firm limits and that's it's it like if you if you really sit with that for a minute and you start thinking about it it's like layers on layers on layers of inequality and all of this stuff that's just like someone decided this is the standard and if you're not that then you have to change to fit the standard and that's just simply how it works and it's like maybe maybe no that's, <laughs> maybe like, that's where the animal <laughs> analogy right when this and is what she's She's this saying here that exactly, and it, I, that's where I go to. I mean, the l- line at the end of the song is, "You made her like that." Yeah, what a shame she went mad. You made her like that. So there's the I, answer. It's you know, you, women, mad women are made. Somebody makes them. Someone is the cause of their madness because they are labeling them mad or doing something to incite that. 
And I love the part before that. That always the part before that to me like captures the heart of this song. You of mean Good the Wives. bridge? <laughs> but particularly, <laughs> good wives always know she should be mad, should be scathing like me, but no one likes a mad woman. And yes. it's that cognitive dissonance of I have the right to be angry because has a couple side flings, but no one likes a mad woman. So I have the I should have yeah. the right to do this, but I am living in a place where I don't have that. And like that, like talk about kind of losing your mind a bit, like living in constant cognitive dissonance like that is like not a way to live. That's awful. Let's read. We'll read through the whole bridge. Um, I'm taking my time, taking my time. Cause you took everything from me watching you climb, watching you climb over people like me. The master of spin has a couple side flings. Good wives always know she should be mad, should be scathing like me, but no one likes a mad woman. What a shame. What a shame. She went mad. You made her like that. I just said it was the bridge, but it's also the end of the song. So the, I don't know if it's technically that I, I the bridge. Love, Jack Antonoff, I let us know. I love the line, but anyway. what a shame she went mad, because I just think it is the most depressing, right. like, statement of the century. Like, it's just like, what a shame. I say it as sarcastic. No, it like, is kind of, it's mad. so loaded. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. very layered. I was just, it's flippant and sarcastic. Another song yeah. where she says, what a shame, is in... Uh, last great American dynasty, all the people, not- the townspeople are saying what a shame he died or whatever, or like, well, I don't remember the exact line, but yeah. it, it's like, whenever you say what a shame, it is kind of like sarcastic or it's kind of like nobody like really care, but it's yes. also like women are powerful, strong creatures. Maybe you're comparing to such regal animals like dragons and scorpions and bears. It's like these beautiful creatures. And then you're like powerful, powerful. They have these and powerful then, creatures. Yet you're just driven to insanity or madness by these actions. Men. I think it's men. I, we don't know anywhere that it's directly men, but the fact that the title yeah. is Mad Woman, I see that it's all about like what's causing the madness. I mean, it could be man, her kids. The other thing that tells me that <laughs> it could be her kids. Yes, that's true. Um, the other thing that tells me that is she's got the line and women yeah, like hunting, yeah. which is too yeah. doing your dirtiest yeah. work for you. Contrast so so with, yeah. the opposite, the contrast there. Um, and then also when it says, you know, master of spin has a couple of side flings, good wives always know she should be mad, should be skating like me, but yeah. no one likes a mad woman. So there you have two different depictions of women. Of You've got, so you've got three options for women. You've got the mad woman. You've got the woman who likes hunting witches and then you have the woman who has also been wronged, but the other option is to just stay quiet because no one likes a mad woman. So what a world we live in if those are the three options for women. Really liked the women like hunting witches too, because I think it... We should do a witches it's... episode. <laughs> um, Sorry. A hundred percent we should do a witches episode. Halloween. But I, um, for some reason, always... Down. Is there a line there? Yeah, do, it's obvious that wanting me dead has really brought you two together. So in my mind, and this is not a firm interpretation, but I associate the women like hunting witches too with the wife. And so the first half of the song is like, she did this, she did this with you, it brought you guys together, but you still cheated on her and she should be mad and she should know that she's mad. But that it kind of, it starts with the like, yeah, she's she's perpetuating this, but there's still, it is kind of an ironic what a shame, but I think you do still have a little bit of a pity of like, it is a bit of a shame. So I think to me, better than revenge, and even a little bit these moments in this song too, is women should support women, a hundred percent. But if a woman is not supporting you, you are not obligated to support her not supporting you that at the end of the day, this is about creating gender equality. And if someone is pushing away from gender equality, that is not a good thing to do. And you should still be able to call that out. You should still fight against that, that you want to support women, but it's not a pass to do whatever you want and support them regardless. I had a long conversation with a friend about female politicians who have different political opinions than me and how that feels that just because someone is a woman doesn't mean that she's going to be a politician who's going to further the f- women overall, you know, like, so <clears throat> I just thought that was interesting in Better Revenge and in this, that you kind of have a female quote unquote opponent, but it is still, it's just interesting. It's a very nuanced thing. Uh, 
Uh, somebody once told me that they Taylor like may have mentioned somewhere that she was inspired by Khaleesi of Game of Thrones for this song. Don't know if that's true, um, but I, oh, I think she said Game of Thrones was a big inspiration for Reputation. Uh, maybe, but yeah, but I, I, I don't know I mean, when the song was written, it. but I think that's interesting. It's an interesting take if we're imagining Amelia Clark here um, because she goes mad at the end and it's very sad and it's. I never saw such Game a shame. of Thrones. I can't do it. It was all, too all I can say is it's such a shame. Uh, what, a shame she went mad. what a shame, a shame. she went mad. Uh, what a um, shame. The other thing that I was going to say is that, when, Jody, when you were bringing up the three kinds of women, I'm like, are we each mm-hmm. doing songs that are one of those women? A different type of Because I think we are. Maybe. Mm. Should be. That's a transition. That's a good one. I have the last song here, and I will preface it by saying we are deep diving this in our next episode. So there's a lot here I want to talk about, but we're really focused on the mad woman aspects of it. And then we'll do a lot more next week. But I chose um, Right Where You Left Me, which is a bonus track on Evermore written by Taylor Swift and Aaron Dessner. I'm pretty sure since it's on the, this is, we had this conversation when we did It's Time to Go. So this came out in January of 2021, not 2020, because it was on the deluxe edition. So pretty sure about that. It's definitely on Evermore. I think it came out on, in 2020, but it didn't go on Spotify until 2021 because we looked oh, this up okay. after we did um, yeah. It's Time to Go. So it, it I did remember come out it was in complex. <laughs> Uh, yes, it, it landed on Spotify January 7th, and there was a whole theory on it's time yeah. to go. Anyway, go okay. back and listen to that one. <laughs> so I did right where you left me, um, and I'm going to try to rein in my nerding out here. Listeners, we know this is going to be a long episode. Buckle <laughs> in. Your popcorn and a glass I'll of wine. Start of it to go. This song, at a high level, recommend listening to it. I actually really recommend listening to it with the lyrics pulled up. It's a pretty, it's a lyrics first song, I would argue. And it's about someone who um, is essentially stuck, that someone moved on. It's uh, a breakup um, in the story. And this person is stuck, quite literally. She, uh, The narrator says, help, I'm still at the restaurant, still sitting in a corner I haunt, cross-legged in the dim light. They say, what a sad sight. So it's painting this image of someone who was um, dumped at a restaurant and then they just never left. Um, they just sat in that booth forever. There's at one point where they say, um, she's still 23 inside her fantasy, how it was supposed to be. Um, if this, if you really like this song, which I do, and you are kind of fascinated by this idea of someone being really stuck, actually really, really recommend Great Expectations um, by Charles Dickens. Miss um, Havisham is uh, left at the altar and she uh, wears her wedding dress for the rest of her life. She stops the clocks um, at the moment that she was left. She leaves her wedding feast out in her house and just this like is never a Mrs. leaves. This Havisham song. So, I'm like, surprised it took literally. this long into a mad, mad woman episode for us to, to bring up I also Abisham. want to bring up Mrs. Yeah, Dalloway because Mrs. Mad Dalloway woman. is also stuck in a relationship. She's not No, mad. but this song, I love she's her. stuck in this old relationship. Like that entire book is about her like stuck in the past and there's a lot of clock imagery as well um, about just like where her life is going. It's like my favorite book. I love Mrs. Dalloway. So the thing I really thought was interesting is uh, you get the, uh, did you hear about the girl who lives in delusion? Breakups happen every day. You don't have to lose it. Lose it. Um, so it's the idea that she's stuck, but people think she's in delusion. When I was thinking Mad Woman, I was thinking a little bit more of the kind of crazy, deluded, um, mentally unwell idea. Um and there's another line too about like you're supposed to move on um oh i did not highlight it and i apologize for that but there's a lot in here everybody about, like, moved it says like everybody yes. moved on yeah everybody moved on i, I stayed, stayed there. there so this what really captured me about this song in this context is this idea of everyone thinks this this narrator is kind of nuts kind of crazy and what she was supposed to do was move on find someone else, still have kids, do all this stuff. There's, I think it's in the bridge where she says like the person comes back, found someone new, they have kids, they have Christmas. So this other person has moved on and lived the life they're supposed to live. But our narrator, she has not. Um, And so something I studied a lot in grad school where I got really nerdy about it was, so the Victorian idea was very strongly of there is a way you are supposed to be. There are things that are appropriate, things that are... um, right um as a woman everyone everyone okay um 
men had a little more leeway, but there was a clear narrative of um, good men, bad men, good women, bad women. We talk about this. If you think about Pride and Prejudice, Darcy is a good man and Elizabeth is a good woman. So they end up together in a happy life. Wickham is a bad man and Lydia is not a good woman. They're very different. Wickham is a way worse person than Lydia is. She's just shallow. But based on this, the standards of the time, they were both they bad. Fit together. And so they end up together in a bad life. And so you get these stories, you get these narratives that reinforce that, like, it, it was I, my Victorian lit professor would always say, a good woman in any Victorian novel will end up married by the end of it because that is the appropriate reward for being a good woman. Um, and it's really, it's interesting. So many thoughts about that, but I will <laughs> hold them back. There's a uh, whole genre of uh, books called Buildings Roman. Um, mm -hmm. And the uh, Jane Eyre follows it perfectly where you start out someone who's like kind of middle, um, not really like a little bit lower than where they should be. And then they rise up way higher than they're supposed to. So in Jane Social Eyre, she's a, wise? a, yes. So in Jane right. Eyre, she is a governess who is, captures the heart of a very rich man. If they had gotten married at that point in the book, that's inappropriate. Governesses should not marry rich men. That's not appropriate. So then it goes very, very low. She finds out all the stuff. She leaves. She's in a really dark place. She's like literally on the streets. But because she made the morally right decision to leave, we get to find out, surprise, surprise, she inherited a lot of money. She's actually quite a wealthy woman herself. And now She's she being... can get married. And then now she can end up where she should appropriately be. She is now an equal in social class. She is now coming in not as a governess, but as someone who would actually be an appropriate match for Mr. Rochester. And then they can have their happy ending. If you get a book where she had gotten married as a governess, that would never have worked out. She would have had to be punished in some way. Um, it's really, really interesting. That like really fascinated me. And we've definitely changed it. We've changed it a lot, but it's something, again, same with the disabilities thing. If you start thinking about that, when the stories and the narratives that we see, you'll see how they are still trying to kind of reinforce something. Um, you'll start seeing what messages are kind of being put out there. But uh, more literally, um, there is a book I highly recommend. It's called The Female Malady by Elaine Showalter. Very academic book, but this was like the core of this idea of starting to academically question the representations of women and women's mental health. Um, and she writes a lot about um, Valette, which is also written by Charlotte Bronte, who wrote Jane Eyre and some other stuff. I wrote a paper about Valette, which is why I started going down this well, path. Will we put the paper <laughs> in the substack is what I want to know. Is our substack this week just going to be... I bet I could find it. Paper. I might still have access to it. It was my favorite paper, favorite paper I wrote in grad school. So there I feel like go. I saved a copy. Uh, might, if I can find be. it, I will put it in there <laughs> for sure. Um, but she also investigated the real life insane asylums and women and how they were treated. And they were constantly being thrown in. Like the things I've said, like the, I was reading the list and it was like, if you were on your period, you could be put into an, like a full blown insane asylum for being on your period, cool. postpartum depression, menopause um not wanting to have sex with your husband for whatever to, reason for <laughs> any reason and Great. she what was really interesting to me is she had these like visual pictures of uh women would come in like kind of dirty and stuff and when they were healed they looked like proper victorian ladies and the idea was that rehabilitation was never about having someone be healthy it was having them fit in they needed to fit into that narrative in the same way that jane eyre can't be a governess who marries a rich man real victorian women couldn't be that they had to fit into that very specific proper Victorian lady mold before they could be released from hell holes. They were so, awful places to be. I guess my question then coming back to the song is you're talking about the Victorian ideals and societal expectations from the Victorian era. Why do we still have the same expectations? Why is she, she still frozen? Because we are direct yeah. descendants of yeah. Victorians. Yeah. Because my Victorian lit professor, my Victorian lit professor said that all the time. She was, incredible she would say like what if studying victorian lit to her was really fascinating because she 
it helped her understand how we got I, I to where we are today. That one of the reasons that this Asian gender studies class was really incredible for me, just in my experience, was because especially today we live in a more diverse community. And sometimes we run into these um, ideas of like, like, why are we even moving forward as a society? And in a lot of ways, it's because there's different ideals and thoughts that are coming together finally in ways that have not ever come together in the past. Social media definitely escalated this, like put this on steroid. Um, I think Mm -hmm. what's really interesting is that women have always been kind of second class citizens (laughs) in a lot of cultures, but always in different ways sometimes. Um, And so when you have multiple cultures that come together, you start to like challenge and push and pull on the norms of individual cultures. And for the longest time, I mean, the United States was a British colony. We're going getting into history stuff, but like, obviously, like a lot of the influences were Christian, British, uh, and to this day remain that way. But now that you have so many different cultures like kind of coming together, we have a natural tendency to kind of question because the things that were norms in the Victorian British Christian rule book are not necessarily norms in other cultures, but there were other things in other cultures that were that were issues. We extensively studied like the Chinese art of foot binding and like the implications for like how uh, women had basically like social classes constructed based on how tightly they could bind their foot because the richest women didn't need to do any work because their, um, their foot, their feet were bound so tightly that they could just sit like only the really, really rich could afford that. And if you were a lower class, you had larger feet. And so larger feet are associated with being poor because you just had to work. You couldn't like afford to bind your feet. Really interesting things like that. So I, I think making a plug for just like, yes, it helps you understand where we're coming from. Um, but I think in terms of where we're going, it's really interesting to understand kind of like how this also happened outside of that because it explains a lot of what's happening today with the changes yeah side note i read a really good book about foot binding. it was a fictional book with that and was a lot about foot binding and i can't remember the name of it but i will figure we'll it out it in It'll the show notes on our show notes and in our book you show. say side note our whole episode this whole podcast i have, I know, I know, side right. I have a non-fiction book note. about foot it's binding also- if anybody wants to say it's written by an asian woman which is what also makes it really interesting is it's not an outside perspective Ooh. but it's called cinderella's stepsisters a revisionist history of foot binding really really good Ooh, interesting Things um, I didn't think we'd talk about on this episode. I know. Find him. Okay. There it's, we go. it's also one of the reasons why I really love the English language because um, we, it's so funny to me when people are like, well, speak English, you're in the US. I'm like, you know, English is just an amalgamation of every language in the entire world. Like, I have very many fun stories about words. I can tell you, like, so many English words have long histories that come from the Middle East, from Asia, and it's just slowly developed. English has just, I mean, it's thanks to colonization and also, um, oh gosh, what were those? The Crusades. Those were like the two big things. What was that thing? I was like, I don't know, like the bad wars that they shouldn't have done. Um, Anyway. Anyways, the song. Back to Taylor Swift. The reason this song reminded me of all of that stuff is because the, the literal Victorian women would be put into this trapped in this insane asylum until they essentially could prove that they could function in the way that society expected them to. And this song to me has always felt like a song. I mean, not even just the song is a song about being trapped where she says, help, I'm still at the restaurant. But she also says things about, cause I'm right where I cause no harm. Um, everybody else moved on breakups happen every day. You don't have to lose it. So there's this clear expectation of other people can move on, but until she, this narrator is willing to, move on and find someone new and get her own kids in Christmas, she is unable to leave this restaurant. She is trapped and that it's not, it's not okay for her to be there. Sad. It, it, it's, it's sort of a self-isolation it feels like, but it's also this idea of just like, she just can't move on and she is getting no pity, no help. Again, the idea isn't let me help you through this. The idea is like, get it together and act like everyone else or stay but, in that booth and leave us alone. Like those well, are your but options. It wasn't her choice. You left me. You left me. No, but I she, love that play on words. She says, "I'm right where you left me," and then you left me no choice but to stay here forever. So the you left. Yeah. What was the what was the word from our poetic repetition? Uh, that- would that one have been anaphora? Yes, because it starts with that you anaphora, left. You, you left. left me. Yeah, that's anaphora. Yeah. yeah. So. So in terms of agency, like she lacks agency here. Like yeah, she is I just not mean she's control. not 
literally in an insane asylum where no, she's, she's legally not, not allowed to leave. But, but yeah. she's also like, like she lacks agency here. Somebody else left and left her no choice but to stay there forever. Um, she has no other options, um, which is really depressing. And then she's just called mad. She's called deluded. Delusion. She, um, yeah. Very much ostracized for struggling with this. Uh, and this is, uh, we'll talk about this more in the deep dive. This is definitely my mental health song. Whenever I'm kind of struggling, this mm. song really speaks to me. I fortunately do have people who help me, but it does, particularly as a woman, there's so many times where you feel like you're really not supposed to show these things. You're not supposed to show pain. You need to, you need to move on. Like you, as a woman, you are supposed to be nowadays being great at your job and making sure your house is clean and start having kids and have them be fashionable why why is kids being fashionable a thing right now like the two-year-olds are unhinged let them in the best way possible let them wear unhinged clothes like my childhood best friend just lets her kid pick out outfits and i'm like yes like give her the freedom to wear awful clothes like why not I, so anyways that, that's a side. I, I i really <laughs> like that and i want to go back to what jody was saying like in some ways i feel like she does have agency because her choice is to not do anything and sit there and be stuck in it which i actually think women historically have not been mm. allowed to do um i was reminded of miranda yeah. lambert has this amazing song called mama's broken heart where she's it's basically like this woman has just gone through a really really bad breakup and her mom is like snap out of it like put on some makeup like weigh those tears put on some makeup get your life together um and 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 come back into society and the the singer is like but it's not my mom's broken heart like she doesn't understand what i'm going through and mm. i don't want to do those things and and in almost not doing that is an act of maybe not rebellion but kind of but it's also an act of healing it's just like a thing that maybe yeah. this person needs to do she's stuck it's almost like ptsd it's like she's stuck she can't move on she she can't move past this even though everyone thinks she should um, and, and going back to your point um, in the last song, Jody, about the three kinds of mad women, I like I really did not catch that at the bottom in that last song. But you have like the woman who is like really mad and vengeful. That's kind of what I was saying. It was better than revenge. You have the mad woman who's like, well, who do you think made her this way? She just goes crazy. And then you have the women who are just kind of they understand, but they can't do anything about they're it. And they're just stuck. And I feel like all three of these songs... Yeah, this is stuck. This it's is like stuck. she could probably rage if she wanted to, but she's frozen. She's frozen, and and that in itself is sometimes labeled as yeah. mad. It's like it's, she's that's still what I'm mad, saying. Right? It's still exactly. labeled she's as mad still because mad. Mrs. Havisham because you're still is not still participating mad. in yeah. society in the right way. The expectations. It says everyone. Everybody. Uh, what is it? They expected me to find somewhere some perspective, but I sat and yeah. stared right where you left me. Right. So she literally says there was this expectation for me, and I didn't meet it. Well, and I feel like too, women. Uh, again, I do think this is overall getting better. I could, I could just see some listeners being like, "That's not always true," and it's like, okay, yeah, but also it's very true that women are still very much expected to be defined by a man not in this like it used to be like you were defined by whose daughter your, your father and then like your husband and then your sons and like that to, is not necessarily true but it is still uh you know in the holiday season if you're a single it's well who are you dating are you dating anyone when are you going to get married and then it's like oh okay it's when are you going to have kids and ken Ken yeah. doesn't exist without Barbie. That's the world that I want to live in. It's Where the opposite. It's because, okay? like, yes. It's Ken and Barbie. No. And so I, I live in Barbie's world. Thank you very much. But so, in this narrative, it's this narrator, in fact, did define themselves by this love. It was a very intense for her, it was a very strong love. It was very important to her. So like that was that I'm you know like that's this is a narrative where it's like this person was going home for like some sort of holidays and they were all so excited she was dating someone she was dating someone and then this person breaks her heart and those same people are like move on and find the next person it's like I did what you expected me to do and I'm and struggling now that it didn't yeah. work out and that is you don't get help there it's like no you're still supposed to be in that relationship you're still supposed to be following this path so get back out there and do it again and like it's. I think our generation is getting better with it too. Um, but like, you just think about how many stories you've heard of women who like aren't in happy marriages because it was like, you had to settle. You had to pick someone. To it stay. was better yeah. to be married than to in, not. In Indian culture, bad. at least, I don't know if this is 
elsewhere too but like oftentimes you'd have like a woman would like very in, in a very difficult situation leave her husband run away come home and then her parents would like beg the husband or his family to take her back. Uh, they'd be like, please, I'm sorry. She <laughs> lost her mind briefly. She, she made a lapse of judgment. Please take her back. We will pay you extra to take her back or whatever. And I feel like that's a trope that is like, at least in Indian culture, like being questioned now openly uh, in media and everything. But the fact that we even have to have that discussion and be like, don't just go like don't sell your daughter back to the abusive household where she came from stick up for her um take her back allow her to move on is like thing that's becoming accepted but it's still it's just worth discussing is is pretty crazy but that's kind of the transition point that we're at yeah yeah it's like um i just feel in general it's like as a woman you have like a day to feel your feelings and then you gotta like buck up and get back on the path or else people are gonna be like hmm what's going on here and I, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll get into this song is very personal to me. So just a warning for the next episode, but I, uh, Chris and I've been married for over 10 years now. And I think it took about five to six years of us being married and saying we weren't going to have kids for people close to us to stop asking. Um, it was, I mean, there were years where I would say it multiple times. Um, shout out to my parents. They were not one of those people. Thank <laughs> goodness i appreciate that about you guys but still with other people if it's like oh you don't want to have kids you'll change your mind or like mm, that doesn't make any sense and just being very dismissive um and also chris was never asked that question it was always me so and then I was gonna, it was my yeah. fault for saying no and i'm like the same way there's like they won't let women get hysterectomies mm -hmm. until they reach yep. menopause because they're like well you might change your mind and it's like yeah. there are women who absolutely know for a fact that they've made up their mind why do you assume that a woman is going to change Especially her mind because the alternatives yeah. can really mess you up if you're expected to stay on these like hormone therapies yeah. for your entire life yeah. yeah yeah but also to everyone who questioned me for years you put a baby in chris's arms for 10 minutes and tell me that we were <laughs> supposed to have kids because we were not meant to have kids <laughs> We are a great aunt and uncle. We were not meant to raise a human being from day one. That is absolutely not who we are. But it was always assumed it was my choice. It was kind of like, well, I think it's the assumption too, and we can wrap this up soon, but I think the assumption is that as a woman, I'm going to raise the kids, so it's my decision to have them, and that Chris is just like, not to be explicit, he's simply providing the starter package, <laughs> and then I'm supposed to take it from there, and it's like, n no, like, I no this is like something we would do together and it's something we don't want to do together so we're not going to do it this is not all on me but that's the expectation and mm. i i i didn't ever get called crazy but i like i definitely got reactions sure people, from people i'm sure people thought it you could see it in their faces i definitely yeah. had people i had someone get kind of emotional like she really loves being a mom and it like hurt her okay. personally and i was like i i'm so glad you love this but like i can't i'm sorry i'm like i don't I don't, don't be sorry, but you shouldn't have to be sorry. Well, like, you shouldn't have to apologize. You're very emotional. <laughs> I know. See, so you that's, mad. That's what their song was. Yeah. I'd like to reclaim Mad Woman. The, <laughs> the Mad Woman, like, name. Like, like, that's the other thing. Is like, you are allowed to be mad. Yeah. Women are allowed to feel angry. And I think what's interesting in these songs, even in the way that we describe them, where, like, somebody else caused the madness. But at the end of the day, you're allowed to be mad. You're allowed to want revenge. Well, You're it's allowed the fact to feel that it's stuck. labeled differently like, when it's women. The, the like Instagram yes. quote of when like, woman. it is yeah. like the biggest like BS in the world that men get to be mad all the freaking time and not get called emotional. But like Literally women get jobs. called emotional. Yeah. Literally so like, their jobs. Oh, have yeah, you seen exactly. a football but game but then god serena <laughs> williams throws her racket on the floor during a tennis match right. and then all of a sudden she's the yeah she's the angry black an woman and it's like yeah. it's just the double yeah. standards um which yeah. is i think i think it is a reclaiming period that we're going through where we can get the, i think mad woman does that beautifully in all these songs i think the fact that you can have female yeah. artists like really authentically expressing the madness within but like justifying it and the anger um yeah. is like the start we hopefully we can get to a point where we don't need to justify it it just becomes acceptable but the fact that we have our own word for it hysterical yeah. is just i mean that itself that's where we started and yeah that's mad <laughs> yeah yeah 
I think well, the day I found out hysteria came from the Greek word for ovaries, I was like, oh, so we were never, ever going to succeed. Like, no. this, we, were, it, we were never, they never wanted this to go well for us. Good to know. Good to know. It's Eve's fault. You got to blame Eve, okay. though, all the way back. Ugh. Anyway, with that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, join us next week as we deep dive this song, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about some uh, Mad Woman stuff, but there's a lot of other stuff here, too, and we will get into it then.